Sure. So, you know, we talked about a gift under a will, a transfer directly from the, you know, the the IRA to the, the foundation. A beneficiary gift, designation gift, is where you have a beneficiary designation form, which, you know, life insurance has, qualified uh, accounts have, Roth IRAs have. And in addition, you know, many uh, bank or, or brokerage accounts can also have a beneficiary designation form called a transfer on death, a TOD or a payable on death, POD form. So this is where you would have the charitable um, you know, transfer at death be accomplished not by a bequest under the will or trust, but rather by designating the foundation on the, the beneficiary form. Great. Yeah. And this is this is something that we're seeing um, done more commonly that we're receiving the life insurance benefits or um, or even some of the the retirement accounts and the assets. So all of these options are, a, you know, really great way to make a powerful difference. Um, but what would a person have to do in order to make that beneficiary designation? Is it is there a, a central place that they can um, specify that they want these different assets to go to a charitable organization or um, does it vary based upon the different types of assets? Yeah, any, you know, every, if it's life insurance, you know, let's just whatever the, the co life insurance company is, or if it's an IRA with a particular f f financial institution, they will have their own forms. So you have to make sure that you're using the form that is for that, that policy or that asset, and that you submit it to the gatekeeper, the life insurance company or the, the custodian for the retirement account, the plan sponsor. As long sure. as the form is completed in a manner that, that each of those will accept and it gets to that, that entity then it, it will be enforceable. Okay. Is it beneficial for the person, the individual to also specify um, in the bequest or will that this is another thing that they've designated? Is that is that ever an issue that may come up? Well, it, it, sometimes we see an interplay. For instance, I may have someone that says, look, I want to make sure I get you know, at least a million dollars in charitable gifts when I die. And I've named, you know, let's say the foundation as a beneficiary on my IRA using the form. But let's say when that individual dies, the IRA is not it's, it's, it's below a million. They've spent it down. It's now only 500,000. There, the will may say, it is my intention to give a million dollars to the foundation. You know, to the extent I have named the foundation as a beneficiary, those beneficiary designations shall satisfy this gift. And if the those beneficiary designations don't fully fund it, then I make a specific gift from my will in order to ensure that the foundation gets a million dollars. That's an example of where, where we may see some interplay. Yeah, very good. Very good information to consider. Um, and you've touched on this, I, I suppose, but can you continue to use your account after you've made your gift? It sounds like, yes, you can. You still have access, correct? Yeah, just a a, de a, dozen, a beneficiary designation form only kicks in when the person dies. So if it's, you know, let's say it is a retirement account or it's a payable on death with an investment management account, when that person dies, the designation kicks in. But until then, it's still the person's asset. So they do with it as they please. And, you know, they can update that beneficiary designation form as often as they like. Sure. Okay. And then any other notes on any key differences between a beneficiary de designation and a bequest in particular? Well, so, you know, the, the bequest is under a, a will or trust, which means there's administration that has to be done by an executor or a trustee before that charitable gift is made. Meaning, you know, if someone dies and it's under the will, the executor's got to go to XYZ Bank, get liquidate that account and eventually cut a check to the foundation. So it can take a little time. In, in addition, depending on the state, there may be a probate fee which says the amount that the executor is handling is subject to a 5% fee that's paid to the local register of wills or the local county. The, the, the beneficiary designation, however, doesn't require anybody else to administer it. If the life insurance policy says XYZ life insurance company pays to the foundation or, you know, my bank is to pay on death to the foundation. When that person dies and a death certificate is produced, life insurance company or bank automatically distributes the funds. So it can be quicker. There's less administrative hassle. And if it is a situation where there may be a probate fee, we've avoided that probate fee. So that's one of the, the benefits of the beneficiary designation over a bequest. Got it. Okay, great. Um, and then can you, I know you've touched on this and you've mentioned a few times business assets, but would you mind just talking a little bit more about opportunities that, that folks might have to leave some benefit, I'm sorry, business assets to a charitable organization? 
Yeah. So again, and oftentimes, you know, closely held business assets, they, it, it's someone's baby, they've worked really hard for it, but maybe there's been considerable appreciation. And, and so a person, you know, particularly if they're thinking of selling that business, they may decide that they want to make a gift of the business interest before they sell it, either directly to the foundation or to a donor advised fund. That way, when they do sell it, because they've given away some of the business interests, they are reducing the capital gains that they are going to pay and they are maximizing the gift. And, and that's because the, the DAF or the, the foundation they don't pay income tax. So using business interests is absolutely a way to satisfy, satisfy charitable gifts. And it's a good way, particularly if, if there's an appreciated business asset and there's going to be a liquidity event.